Welcome everybody to the Ireland East Hospital Group Grand Rounds being presented this week by the Royal Victoria Eye and Ear Hospital. And we're very grateful to Mr. Edward Lowen and Dr. Aoife Smith for presenting the cases and Professor Donnick O'Brien for his, uh, his input. So if you guys want to, this is the last Ireland East Hospital Group uh, Grand Rounds for this academic year. So thanks to everybody who's contributed. And look forward to seeing you again in September. Um, so if you want to start sharing the slides. Yep. Can you see my slides okay? Yep. Yes. Great. Thank you. So my name is Aoife Smith. I'm one of the SHOs in the Iron Ear. And I'm going to present a brief case of an interesting sixth nerve palsy and just talk a bit about sixth nerve palsies in terms of the anatomy, syndromes associated with them, signs and symptoms of a sixth nerve palsy, uh, important differential and what not to miss on examination, what investigations to do and who and when we image, and then some of the management options. So we have a 34-year-old gentleman who presented with a nine-month history of double vision which was horizontal in nature and greater for distance. Of note, he had a past medical history of a skull-based chordoma, which was diagnosed in August 2016 and treated with proton beam therapy in Germany at the end of 2016. And was doing well in this regard, was just under surveillance with neurosurgery in Beaumont. He had no other past medical history and no ophthalmic history. On examination, his vision was very good. It was 6-5 in both eyes, anterior exam anterior segment examination was normal, intraocular pressure and dilated fundus exam was also normal. But on examination of his eye movements, he had complete limitation of left abduction. So he was unable to turn his left eye out and he had a large left esotropia. So the eye was turning in, measuring 65 prism diopters at near and 85 at distance. He had no binocular single vision when was unable to fixate centrally. So because of the duration of his symptoms and the size of his esotropia, he was unable to be managed with prisms and underwent surgery. So he had a left superior rectus lateral transposition, which involves disinserting the superior rectus and transposing it towards the lateral rectus. And this was augmented with a posterior fixation suture. And he also had a left medial rectus resection. So a weakening procedure of the medial rectus measuring nine millimeters. And I'll go through that in a few, in a few minutes. Who's asking? four months post-operatively, and he was very happy with his results. He had no double vision with a small face turn of 10 to 15 degrees. He had a small esophoria, so the turn came and went, and he had good binocular single vision and still a minus three limitation of left abduction, but he was aware that that would be the case and was happy. So six nerve palsy is the most common ocular motor paralysis we see in adults. Um, it The six nerve supplies just the lateral rectus muscle for abducting the eye, um, but it has a long intracranial course and it's important to be familiar with the course um, to help you in diagnosing or locating where the lesion may be. So the six nerve nucleus lies in the dorsal pons ventral to the floor of the fourth ventricle and it lies in close relation to the horizontal gaze centers and the seventh nerve nucleus. It then courses superiorly and anteriorly to exit the brainstem at the pontomedullary junction. From there, it courses over the skull base through the subarachnoid space and is crossed by the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Um, it pierces the dura and courses over the petrous apex of the temporal bone and enters Dorello's canal before traveling through the cavernous sinus. In the cavernous sinus, then it lies below the third, fourth and first branch of the fifth nerve and it lies more medial. These lie in the wall of the cavernous sinus, but the sixth nerve is medial, closer to the internal carotid artery. So it's more prone to damage. In the orbit then, it travels in via the superior orbital fissure and through the annulus of Zin, which is a tendinous sheath, which also um, encloses the third nerve, second, and the nasociliary nerve. So there are a vast number of causes of sixth nerve palsies. The most common we see generally in adults is microvascular, but uh, it's important to mention a few others. So um, 
generally trauma or tumor can affect the nerve at any point in its course, tumor either directly or via raised intracranial pressure. At the nuclear and fascicular regions, then demyelination or stroke may lead to a six nerve palsy. In the subarachnoid space, we'd worry about raised intracranial pressure or uh, inflammatory causes like sarcoid or lupus or infectious causes like TB or syphilis. When it courses over the apex of the temporal bone, um, mastoiditis is an important cause to be aware of. And in the cavernous sinus, we'd consider uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis or fistula or internal carotid artery aneurysm. And then in the orbit, again, trauma, tumor would be the main ones or infection. So there are a number of syndromes associated with six nerve palsy. I won't go into them in too much detail, um, but the first three are Pontine syndromes. Foville syndrome involves the inferior medial pons and can affect a number of cranial nerves as well as sympathetic fibers. And Miller-Gubler and Raymond syndrome are both ventral Pontine syndromes with, which are very similar, but Raymond syndrome only involves the medial aspect, so spares the seventh nerve. And then Gradenigo syndrome, um, is when the petrous apex of the temporal bone is affected by mastoiditis and you get the classic triad of six nerve palsy, otitis media and facial pain related to trigeminal involvement. So in terms of symptoms and signs that these patients present with, um, if it's an isolated six nerve palsy, it will always be horizontal double vision. And it may not always be present, it may only be when the patient looks in distance because when they're looking up close, your medial rectus is pulling the eye in, or it may only be when they're looking towards the side of the lesion. So if they have a right six nerve palsy, when they look left, um, the medial rectus can pull the eye all the way over to the left, but when they look right, they're unable to look totally out. They have limitation of abduction, so you get the double vision. It's important to check for any signs or symptoms suggestive of raised intracranial pressure, like headache, nausea, vomiting, or pulsatile tinnitus, um, and to ask about any other symptoms that may suggest involvement of other cranial nerves as well. In terms of signs, then, esotropy, as I mentioned, is greater for distance than near. They'll have limitation of abduction and lateral incompetence. So that's what I mentioned about um, the degree of esotropia will be different depending on the direction of gaze. So it'll be more in the direction of the lesion. Uh, it's essential to look for disc swelling in these patients to rule out papilledema because this six nerve palsy may just be a false localizing sign uh, leading to raised intracranial pressure. They can present with abnormal horizontal saccadic eye movements as well. Rather than the usual fast slow, they get a floating saccade. Um, and it's useful to look for corneal or abnormal corneal sensation suggestive of tri trigeminal involvement or hearing loss. So the differential for a six nerve palsy is quite fast, um, but just to mention a few, myasthenia gravis is, is a good one to be aware of. They can present with um, limitation of abduction, but they'll have the key symptom of fatigability, so symptoms will get worse throughout the day. Pyroid eye disease, again, can have an esotropia, but this is generally due to an issue with restriction of the medial rectus rather than weakness of the lateral rectus. And you'd probably see other signs of thyroid eye disease or systemic hyperthyroidism. Orbital trauma then, if you have a medial wall blowout fracture or an iatrogenic cause, so in sinus or nasal surgery, um, the recti can get damaged as well. And then other causes include infantile esotropia, Duane syndrome, which is a congenital horizontal eye movement disorder where they get limitation of abduction in type one. Uh, high myopia, where you can get inferior displacement of the lateral rectus and then therefore weakening of your abduction and decompensating distance esophoria or accommodative spasm. So in terms of the history and exam, asking about fluctuation of symptoms may suggest um, myasthenia gravis as the cause. It's important to ask about pain, any past medical history of cancer, diabetes or thyroid disease. We would always ask about symptoms of giant cell arteritis uh, in any patients over 50. Cranial nerve examination, looking for involvement of any other cranial nerves to suggest maybe one of these syndromes. And corneal sensation is important to check uh, to assess the function of the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, but we do this before checking intraocular pressure because you're instilling anesthetic onto the cornea at that stage. And as I mentioned before, examining the discs 
uh, to look for any papilledema. In terms of investigations, then we check for any vascular risk factors, um, FBC, ESR and CRP for GCA, uh, syphilis and Lyme titers might be considered in certain cases. And I suppose the big question is who we image. So for patients under the age of 45 or 50, we scan them all with MRI with contrast. Um, if they're over 50 and they have my vascular risk factors, they may not get a scan, but if they have any of these kind of concerning features, they would. So pain, bilateral sixth nerve involvement, a combination of cranial nerve palsies, evidence of disc swelling, if they've had any recent trauma, or if there's an absence of vascular risk factors, we would scan them, as well as any history of cancer or an unresolving sixth nerve palsy for the last three months. So for the management, the microvascular sixth nerve palsies tend to resolve after about three to six months. But if they are suffering from double vision, occluding one eye um, can be useful to help them maintain a single image, as well as prisms to relieve the diplopia. And Botox can have a useful role in certain scenarios, which I'll go through in a minute. In terms of surgeries, then there are a number of different options, horizontal muscle surgeries. Um, and transposition surgery. So horizontal muscle surgery is either tightening or weakening the medial and lateral rectus. And transposition involves disinserting the vertical recti and transposing them towards one side. And this can be done either with an adjustable technique um, if appropriate. So Botox is done to the medial rectus to weaken it and therefore bring the eye back out into primary. It's useful in children to reestablish early binocular single vision and prevent the development of amblyopia. Um, however, it's important to be aware it doesn't speed up the resolution of the sixth nerve palsy and it may mask uh, their recovery. And 10% may get side effects such as atosis, which if you're trying to prevent amblyopia is not what you want. Um, it can also be used to assess for residual lateral, lateral rectus function. So if there is an element of medial rectus contracture, by giving Botox to the medial rectus, you'll weaken it and remove that element, and you can assess how much the lateral rectus is uh, weakened. It can also be used to prevent medial rectus contracture. So that can happen if the eye is turned in for more than six months. But generally, um, its main role is for longer term management of small under and over corrections after surgery. So when choosing um, what operation to do for these patients and, and whether to do surgery, it's important to be clear with the patient and manage their expectations and explain clearly, I suppose, what's achievable with the surgery. So the aim is to reestablish a useful central area of binocular single vision so they can function day to day um, and possibly to relieve uh, a head posture it's not to restore full extraocular movements, and that's really important um, to explain to the patient. So the choice of surgery then depends on how much residual function there is in the lateral rectus, whether it's a paresis or a palsy. Um, it also depends on whether they're suitable for an adjustable suture technique, which involves possibly adjusting the sutures at the bedside after surgery under local anesthetic. So as you can imagine, a lot of people wouldn't tolerate someone coming at their eye that close. When they're awake. So um, force duction testing then as well is, is important in deciding what surgery to do. And that is done intraoperatively with this forceps, moving the eye side to side to see if there's any restriction in the muscles. So horizontal muscle surgery is useful when there is residual uh, lateral rectus function. What you do is disinsert the lateral rectus, shorten it and reinsert it at its insertion point. So you're shortening it and tightening it. Um, to increase the strength and pull the eye um, out back into primary. And this can be done with the medial rectus recession, which is disinserting the medial rectus and moving its insertion back on the globe uh, to weaken its pull effect. Or it can be done with a combination of either the same operations, but on the other eye to um, align the two eyes and create binocular single vision. If there is no lateral rectus function left. Full tendon transposition is, is or transposition surgery in general is the surgical option of choice. Um, 
so the traditional approach is to disinsert the vertical recti, the superior and the inferior, and transpose them laterally towards the lateral rectus. And this can be augmented with um, either a Foster or Buckley suture, which is suturing the muscle belly either to the sclera or to the lateral rectus itself. With this surgery, there's a risk of anterior segment ischemia because uh, each of the recti contain two ciliary arteries that supply the blood to the anterior segment. Um, generally, this doesn't occur if less than three recti are disinserted, but it's important to be aware of. And there are options for vessel sparing surgery. So possibly leaving the edges of the muscle and just um, taking the middle two thirds of the tendon and sparing the ciliary arteries. This full trend tendon transposition can be done in combination with Botox of the medial rectus or a staged medial rectus recession. So um, doing a recession at a later date to reduce this risk of anterior segment ischemia. So the Hummelstein procedure then is um, where we split the vertical recti, the superior and the inferior in half, and the lateral halves are transposed towards the lateral rectus. And again, this can be done in combination with the medial rectus Botox or recession, but it has a lower risk of anterior segment ischemia because you're sparing at least one ciliary artery in each of the vertical recti. However, reoperation can be difficult with this surgery. Jensen procedure again involves splitting the vertical recti, but also splitting the lateral and um, moving the lateral half of the superior and inferior towards each half of the lateral and looping them and suturing them together. Um, again, there's a lower risk of anterior segment ischemia because you're not disinserting, but reoperation in this surgery can be very difficult and it's generally not the procedure of choice. So our patient had a crouch procedure which is a refinement of the traditional approach of uh, full tendon transposition. He had the superior rectus only transposed towards the lateral rectus and combined with a supramaximal medial rectus recession. So generally you don't recess the medial rectus past 6.5 millimeters, um, but our patient had a nine millimeter resection. Uh, so it was moved quite far back on the globe. And then it can be done in combination with a, a augmentation suture which can be sutured either into the globe or into the lateral rectus. And this operation is easy to redo, so that's a, an advantage of it. And again, you're sparing the inferior uh, rectus, so lower risk of anterior segment ischemia. And lastly, then the Nishida procedure, which again has the advantage of uh, no muscle disinsertion, so a much lower risk or no risk of anterior segment ischemia. Um, in this procedure, the lateral edges of the superior and inferior rectus are sutured and, and dragged over uh, towards the lateral rectus and sutured into the sclera um, closer towards there to augment its effect pulling laterally. Um, and reoperation in this case is, is easy to do as well. So I'll finish with just a summary of the different surgical procedures available and their risks or their benefits and risks. Um, this isn't my rating, this is Mr. Lone's procedure of preference. Um, but you can see from our patient's case that they can do really well um, with the appropriate procedure for them and good patient counseling. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Aoife, for that fantastic presentation. I think Prof. O'Brien uh, knows yep. this question, so maybe let you. Yeah. Uh, just to echo what Tomas said there, well done, Aoife. Complete tour de force presentation. Fantastic. Um, now, obviously, it, the patient had a, a cavernous sinus uh, tumour and it was filling the cavernous sinus and eroding into the sphenoid sinus. So we actually got tissue from it by going endoscopically up into the sphenoid sinus and actually taking a biopsy of the exo exophytic portion of it that was going into the sphenoid sinus. I just say this just as a general comment in terms of the, the whole importance of, you know, histology and tumor diagnosis in general, in that, you know, obviously with regard to the cavernous sinus, for something confined to the cavernous sinus could be a surgical no-go area. And sometimes there may be a tendency to treat blindly without histology. And I would just kind of add a note of caution, particularly with regard to the whole diagnosis of a lymphoma. Um, so um, we were lucky in this case in that um, 
there was an exophytic portion of it going into the into the sphenoid sinus and we could get histology there and sometimes as i said then one is left with a dilemma in, in situations where a tumor is confined to the cavernous sinus and one day ultimately if there is a difficulty getting uh, histology after actually have to confront that and go into the cavernous sinus just yeah, yes to most absolutely i i presume the 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 abducing nerve palsy was a consequence of the proton beam treatment I, I would have thought which of course is a huge radiation dose uh, much greater than conventional radiotherapy upwards of 75 to 80 grays of of radiation because of the the malignant potential of a cordoma just two queries. Uh, the, the, he had a nine-month history of this. Was that a COVID-related yeah. late presentation? Uh, do you think? Um, um, I think so. I, I I think at one stage he had some radiation changes in his temporal lobes and a lot of memory difficulties afterwards. Um, so I, I suppose so. Yes. Yeah. And the, the other question: the, the treatment he received in Germany. Just uh, how come Germany and is it sort of conventional treatment that's given here as well? And we just don't have any proton B machines here, Tomas. So um, that is, you know, the standard of care for cordomas in general. Uh, you know, our, our pediatric colleagues for certain pediatric tumours do send children abroad for proton B treatment, for, particularly with regard to... Um, um, posterior fossa tumours in children. You may have seen some controversy on the BBC with regard to one or two children regarding that um, last year. Yeah. And interesting, Germany rather than the UK, is it, is, is, is it because it's such rare? Uh, uh, no, we just seem to have a good work. I think, I don't know if it's my connection, but have we lost Prof O'Brien? I think we've lost him. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Um, any comments? Um, Mr. Lone, you're obviously involved in this case and operated on the patient. Yeah, um, thanks. That was well presented, very well presented, Aoife. Um, yeah, I suppose the interesting thing for me about this case was uh, he did extremely well, but it's uh, the operation that he had is, is not my operation of choice anymore. So I tend to go for the Nishida procedure, um, which is where you don't disinsert any of the, the muscles, potentially any of them, um, depending on the size of the ESO from the sixth, you can add a medial rectus recession, um, but up to quite a moderate size of misalignment or deviation, you don't actually even have to do that. And the results that I've had have been extremely good. And um, I was just reminded actually, because um, when I think about it, I think of the Nishida as being a more recently described operation, but it's actually one that goes almost 10 years further back than the Crouch procedure. Um, and yet, I suppose, internationally, probably more people do the Crouch than the Nishida. Um, maybe the Nishida has been lost in translation or something. Edward, can I ask, is it, is it common that you need to reoperate? Um, not with the Nishida, um, you know, I've really just had a kind of amazingly good results. Now, of course, with these patients, you know, you have to really carefully um, counsel them preoperatively that they're still going to have a limitation of abduction uh, in the affected eye. But the whole point is to try and centralize their field of binocular single vision and not induce um, uh, um, not induce an exo in the opposite direction. Um, but yeah, they've, they've done very well. I haven't had to, um, I've only actually, I've only had to reoperate on one and that was um, because she had a bilateral sixth and um, she had massive deviation. And she also unfortunately ended up with a little bit of vertical deviation after her bilateral Nishida. So I just had to kind of tweak things. 
um, with for the surgery for her. But um, yeah, touch wood so far, so good with them. That's based on their their own kind of subjective feedback to you, then is it as to whether you decide yeah, to reoperate? Yeah, and they're, they're orthoptic measurements. So, you know, we measure the, the physical position of the eye as well. Um, and that, that, will, that will give us, you know, an idea where things are. But subjectively, you know, they may, if she was coming back then with some vertical double vision. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, man. Uh, Flinch, I think, has got his hand up. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me. Sorry, I have an interconnect, uh, internet problems. As a neurologist, of course, thank you. That was a lovely presentation. Even we often go think about where is the lesion, what is the lesion, and eye movements are ideal for that. I always think that perhaps we don't teach them properly, and uh, people struggle with them. Um, and um, it really is very helpful in the casualty department and elsewhere doing good eye movements because they're very helpful for localizing from a neurological viewpoint. I think it's just very helpful to consider just two simple tests: and pursuit eye movements which we all should do in the casualty where the patient follows the, the image back and forth. And that's an involuntary following. Once the patient focuses on the, I usually use a 50 euro note because patients watch a 50 euro note. Then you get nice pursuit eye movements in all directions. And it's a lovely test of midbrain and palms because third, fourth and sixth, really helpful is the patient's midbrain and palms intact, vertical gaze. And then the saccadic movement, of course, the 50 euro up on top, and then back to your nose. The problem is they get stuck in the 50 euro, but it is actually helpful to use a 50 euro. I use it yesterday in clinic and you're looking down gaze, up gaze, horizontal, rapid movement, back forth, back forth is really helpful because you get a great test of brainstem and, and brain function and an underutilized. Uh, the sixth is lovely and it's, it's one of those ones that's tricky, isn't it? Just the cavernous sinus aspect, I just mentioned the six floats free within the cavernous sinus beside the carotid. So sometimes when you go looking for it, you looked on the lateral wall of cavernous sinus, third, fourth, V1, V2. So it needs a close look at the V1, V2. Have you got involvement of the lateral wall of cavernous sinus? Is there a fourth, is there a third? I think in this case it was just a six. So you're sitting within the cavernous sinus itself. So presumably Donica might comment the tumor was within the canal, this sinus. Maybe, I don't know whether it was sparing the lateral wall or not, if there wasn't V1, V2, 3 and 4, uh, but that's what you might imagine that's going on. In that circumstance, you look closely for horners because the sympathetic pops from carotid to 6 and back again within the cavernous, and that gets you right there at the cavernous sinus. Uh, only last of the comment I make is that what's often mistaken, you're looking at a patient uh, with a sixth nerve, sometimes you have a gaze palsy, and there's a thing called a nuclear six that Aoife didn't pass by there, I touched upon. So the nucleus of the six contains two sets of neurons anatomically. One are pulsatile neurons that fire the nerve laterally. So that's, and then there are interneurons, of course, that pop over to form the medial longitude fasciculus to yoke the third nerve. Otherwise, of course, we just end up one eye moving, we get double vision. So firing neurons, interneurons, and they come together nicely. And that's, of course, when we're looking for the internuclear thamoplegia, that interneuron pathway is disrupted. But the nuclear six causes a gaze problem. Neither eye moves that aside. And there's lovely, lovely little eponyms for that. And there's a bit of an Irish aspect to that, actually, which I might plug for ourselves in that, of course, there's a what's now called a one and a half syndrome where if you have a nuclear six and the eyes don't move, don't go to one side, but also the other inter internuclear thermoplegia is there. So the, the only movement of the eyes is just going one side. They've lost one and a half of all our horizontal line movements. If with that, you get a seventh as well, because the seventh, as Eva pointed out, comes out laterally, sweeps around the nucleus of six and then goes out and you can get both together in the dorsal palms. Then you add the seventh to the one and a half, you get an eight and a half syndrome. And in Ireland, we described the 16th and a half syndrome, which was a patient with a one and a half syndrome, a seventh to make an eight and a half and an ipsilateral eighth because of an infarct. And that's the part of the literature. So I'll put a plug for that. And last but not least, never forget my gravis. It's the one I always make a mistake, but I think of a sixth. I don't think about it. And I keep making that mistake. Keep it in the back of your mind. My mimics all eye movements. You've got to be very careful. Sometimes you get a clue as for said fatigability, but not always. The other time you do often get, it's actually the saccade movement, that rapid movement in myasthenia is actually normal speed. It might be very short, and if you're able to watch it, you see a quick movement laterally. Whereas if it's a six nerve palsy, the saccade will be slow. So sometimes you get a clue in that one, but that's sometimes hard to see. That's it. Uh, we lost Prof O'Brien there. Any further yes. comments? Uh, no, just, just to echo that, Thanks, Tim, it was a great contribution. No, just to echo um, what I said earlier about the histology. Uh, this tumor, Tim, was filling the cavernous sinus, but it was exophytic into the sphenoid sinus, 
So we got histology from that going into the sphenoid sinus where it was breaching the wall of the sphenoid sinus. We got, but other cavernous sinus tumors can be exophytic into the medial temporal lobe area, and you can get histology that way. Um, so, you know, before calling something a cavernous sinus meningioma, uh, which we all like to do, be very careful. Don't, you know, make sure radiologically it's palognomonic of that. But I think if it's certainly enlarging, you're going to have to get histology um, and be wary of the, the whole concept of a lymphoma within the cavernous sinus for which you'd have to get histological diagnosis. Thanks, Thank, you again. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic so presentation. Well done, Ethan. Thank you. Thanks, Eva. Well done. Um, so if there's no further comment on that presentation, we might move to the second case then from Mr. Lowell. Thanks you. very much. And thanks, Tim, for those very excellent additional comments on that as well. And thanks to Prof O'Brien for your input as well. Thank you. Uh, not at all, Ed. Any time. Cheers. Um, so this is a recent case that, um, uh, that I found interesting. And um, I'm not sure if the rest of you will find it interesting, but hopefully some will. Um, but if nothing else, uh, if you can take this away from this presentation, and ponder the um, brilliance of this cartoon, uh, that would be great. So this was a 48 year old uh, female nurse um, who was referred to me in November, 2021 with double vision that was um, horizontal in nature. Uh, she had a history since about 2015 of Graves disease um, and she was known to already have thyroid eye disease, um, having presented with classical symptoms and signs of same with proptosis, periorbital edema, conjunctival edema, and limitation of eye movements, which we classically see. Um, she already had a lot of treatment by the time she got to me. She had had three courses of um, steroids, which were all orally delivered in uh, between 2019 and 2020 but this didn't have much impact on her condition. Um, she had a thyroidectomy in July, 2020, and she had retroorbital radiotherapy in January, 2021. Um, throughout 2021, it was noted that she had problems with her intraocular pressure, and this was treated with topical drops and diamox or acetazolamide orally. She also had selective laser trabeculoplasty, which is a laser procedure for glaucoma. Um, but this didn't really have any impact. And the query from the consultant dealing with her was whether or not her intraocular pressure problem was due to high orbital pressure because it fluctuated with gaze position, increasing on up gaze in the right eye from 20 to 27 and in the left eye from 26 to 34 millimeters of mercury. Then in November, 2021, she had bilateral orbital decompressions and she got to me in February 2022 this year, uh, complaining of horizontal double vision and a left esotropia with minimal left hypotropia, but not symptomatic from her hypotropia. Her vision was good in each eye, and she had um, two millimeters of upper lid retraction bilaterally, which again we see in thyroid eye disease. She had normal anterior segments, normal discs and maculae. And her pressure in primary gaze was normal, the range being 10 to 21. And then this is just an illustration of the limitation of her eye movements. So she had um, minus two. Minus two means that she can only get 50% of the way up into elevation. And minus one is she can get 75% across into abduction. So she was limited in elevation and abduction bilaterally. And she was symptomatic with her esotropia, the eye being pulled into convergence. Um, her orthoptic measurements then showed this esotropia to be 30 prism diopters. So in terms of degrees, that's a 15 degree. If you think of all around your head being 360, this is a 15 degree pull in um, with a very small left hypotropia. And there was relative cometance when you look um, across her measurements left to right and up and down. Um, and this fits with this mnemonic, I'm slow, which tells you the order of the muscles 
that are involved in thyroid eye disease, and I'll touch on that later. Um, so my plan for her at that stage was um, she already had been using prisms, but they were insufficiently controlling the problem for her. So my plan was to do um, a maximal left medial rectus recession for her because she was um, symptomatic with her left esotropia. So um, about a month later, six weeks later, she had left medial rectus recession of 6.5 millimeters and pretty much all strabismus surgery is done under general anesthetic. Um, you can do it under local anesthetic, and if you want to be macho about it, you can do it under topical anesthetic, but I don't recommend that. And um, I, I think it's that's just machoism, really. It's not the best thing for the patient. It's not particularly nice, but it has been described. Um, so when she came back a month after, um, she was quite happy. She didn't have any double vision, but she did say that her eyes still felt tight in upgaze. And she did, interestingly, have a residual esotropia of 12 prism diopters. But she started off with 30, and I did a 6.5 millimeter recession. And um, typically, when you're doing muscle surgery, you consider that each millimeter of muscle movement will give you three prism diopters of correction. So this almost fit exactly with that, um, uh, that, that, that kind of expectation. Interestingly, even with this level of ESO, she didn't have any double vision. And um, her intraocular pressure was still increasing with upgaze. Uh, so this really is indicative of the restriction of her inferior recti. So my conclusion was that she had had a good initial result, but that she may need bilateral inferior rectus surgery to address this tightness that she was feeling in upgaze, even though there wasn't a misalignment vertically at that point, and I am yet to reassess her. She should be coming to me next month. So um, as you all know, glaucoma is raised intraocular pressure. No, it's not. Um, so this is the typical medical student um, definition of glaucoma, but glaucoma is not just raised intraocular pressure. Glaucoma is an optic neuropathy. Now it's usually associated with it raised intraocular pressure, and it usually causes characteristic changes at the optic disc and in the visual field. And the concept of glaucoma in this case, which um, was interesting to me um, because, well, I suppose I already knew about it, but it really was just a red herring in this case. Um, in glaucoma, you have many treatment options, which include topical drops or um, oral or IV treatment or different types of laser or nowadays minimally invasive glaucoma surgery where you put a small little drainage implant um, implanted at the trabecular meshwork or the traditional approach of surgery with the trabecular plasty or uh, drainage tube shunt devices. Um, so in this case, Braley's sign uh, was really relevant and that is well described um, from a strabismus point of view in patients with thyroid eye disease. Um, thyroid eye disease is a restrictive myopathy, and there are different types of restrictive myopathy, and most of them have the same types of features, whereby you have limitation of eye movement with ductions and versions being equally limited. That will be different in palsies, where they will be differently affected, the ductions and versions. Saccadic velocity is normal in these cases, but it's often reduced in amplitude. Rayleigh's sign, then, is gaze-dependent elevation of the intraocular pressure. And it depends on where the limitation or where the restricted muscle is, and it's going to be opposite that restricted muscle. And it's um, it's uh, you know kind of positive, I suppose, if you have a greater than or equal to five millimeter of mercury difference in the intraocular pressure readings between into the restricted gaze position versus primary or away from the restricted gaze position. And it occurs in about 20% of patients with thyroid eye disease. Um, in restrictive myopathies, you can have a reversal of the deviation in opposite gaze directions. So you can have an ESO in one direction, a convergent squint, and then in the opposite direction, it can be an EXO or a divergent type of a squint. You can get global traction. You can have a positive force duction test. So that's an intraoperative test where you move the eye around passively and you can feel the tightness of the muscle. And you can have normal force generation testing, but this is a test that I don't do. 
um, and it is a test that's done um, in the clinic whereby you grasp the, um, the eye and you ask the patient, you grasp it with a forceps and you ask the patient to look uh, left or right or up or down and see, you, you, you kind of subjectively try and um, determine the, the force that the eye is generating in, in, in its excursions. And then of course, HES testing can be illuminating in these cases. So thyroid eye disease itself, well, um, it's an autoimmune orbitopathy. It occurs more frequently in females than males. Uh, some places you'll read that the um, ratio is up to seven to one. It usually presents uh, in the fourth to six decades. And importantly, the eye disease is not temporarily linked to thyroid status. So the patient can be a thyroid, hypothyroid or hyperthyroid at the, at the time they present with, uh, with eye symptoms. And smoking is super important in these cases. It makes it worse um, and it makes the treatment less effective and it makes the course of the disease longer. So it's really important to try and get these patients to stop smoking. Um, there are lots of systemic and ophthalmic signs in thyroid eye disease, and um, these are just the eye signs. So working from the outside in, in the eyelids, you can get edema, you can get retraction or lag, and you can get this typical appearance of a thyroid type stare, which um, probably everyone knows what it looks like. Uh, conjunctiva can be injected or red, and it can be chemose, that's conjunctival edema. Uh, you can get dryness of the cornea or in uh, severe cases where they have poor or, uh, you know, or incomplete lid closure, they can have exposure keratopathy and this can lead to ulceration and infection um, in their muscles. They can get restriction, um, they can have double vision and then this I'm slow mnemonic tells you the order that the muscles tend to be infected, uh, affected in thyroid eye disease. So the inferior recti tend to be affected first, then the medial, then the superior, then the lateral recti, and then lastly, the obliques. You don't often see the obliques affected in these cases, that's unusual. Um, you can obviously get proptosis and 5% will develop a compressive optic neuropathy. So I hope at least some of you recognize this actor and uh, possibly the film um, from which this is taken. But of course, um, although this displays a classical type of thyroid appearance, it's not in the typical um, gender. So this is more typically what you will see uh, it occurring in a female and you get these classical type signs with the upper lid retraction, the redness of the conjunctiva, Caruncular edema, so that's that little fleshy bit medially, and then periorbital peri um, edema. And this and the last one are both classical kind of thyroid stare appearances. So, investigation well, the clinical signs are really um, classical to pick up and uh, to look for in these cases. Your HES chart, usually if it's a mechanical restriction, the affected side will show a compressed field of eye movement. And you can see that there on the left side. Um, the blood thyroid functions can be normal or, or up or down. You can have positive thyroid associated antibodies and um, the MRI with stir sequence can show the uh, swelling in the muscles or fibrotic muscles. And the stir sequence particularly is important to show the difference between both. Um, classically, um, the, you'll hear about this Rundle's curve in thyroid eye disease, and this uh, just demonstrates the, um, the progress through inflammation, swelling, and then finally to fibrosis in these cases. There are different classification systems for thyroid eye disease activity, and they all have um, their uses, but some are a little bit complicated. So the Moritz uh, clinical activity score, that's probably one of the older ones. Then no specs is useful because it's all mnemonics. So the mnemonic is, it stands for no signs or symptoms, then only signs, then soft tissue changes, proptosis, extraocular muscle involvement, corneal involvement, and then finally sight loss, which you absolutely want to avoid in these people. And then the visa classification that um, rates the uh, signs and symptoms based on the vision, inflammation, strabismus, and their appearance. 
And then again, another one which is probably often used is the UGOGO, the European Graves um, Classification System. Um, thyroid cases, they do best with multi-specialty involvement and you really need to get everyone involved from an early stage for the best outcomes for these patients. So you've got a uh, general, um, you know, on the more kind of general thyroid status side, you've got involvement with endocrinology, radiology, radiation oncology and ENT. And from our own side, it's a multi-specialty eye involvement um, that will give the best outcome for these patients as well. As I said already, smoking cessation is just so important in these cases and can't be stressed enough. Um, when we do in, in intervene ophthalmologically, the order that it should be done is firstly to decompress the orbit if necessary, and that can be done either medically with steroids or immunomodulation or um, surgically. And often you'll need to involve ENT uh, for the decompression. And um, secondly, I will come in for the strabismus surgery. And then lastly, you will do lid surgery if necessary. And it's important before intervening um, with strabismus surgery to wait for the disease to be stable because you don't want to be operating on a position that the eye is in and they're still active and it progresses or it goes in the opposite direction. You, you don't want to be facing that situation. So you need to wait at least six months and in the meantime, you can manage these patients conservatively with either prisms or occlusion if they're very bad. Um, but it is important, frustrating for the patient, of course, but important to, to wait. Um, the aims of management really are to get a comfortable patient um, and to get, get them back to a situation where they have a satisfactory level of vision um, and they have a satisfactory alignment and appearance of their eyes. So you want to really try and centralize their field of binocular single vision. If possible, you want to enlarge that field of binocular single vision. And if they do have an anomalous or abnormal head posture, and these patients, because the inferior recti are firstly effective, they often will have a, a chin up or a head back kind of head posture um, to uh, alleviate that sense of tightness when they're, they're looking up. And that can be present even in primary position if the inferior recti are, are, are that tight. And you want to try and uh, relieve that for them. And then lastly, if possible, you want to try and improve the range of movement of their affected eye or, or both eyes. Um, as with six nerve palsies, in the first presentation, managing patient expectations is really important because you usually can't restore a full range and you know, complete normality for these patients um, unless it's all medical and they actually haven't had to have any surgical intervention at all. Um, in six nerve palsies, my old boss, when I was a fellow in the UK, um, he frequently would say to his patients um, that uh, he'd point up, up to the ceiling and he'd say, if he can't fix you, I will. Um, but <laughs> I, maybe I'm a little bit more Irish in my uh, approach and I'm more reserved than to, to, to say that. But I will say that I will try and fix them uh, if the big man can't. Um, so in these cases, you know, multiple surgeries may be required and we may need to operate on both eyes. And sometimes the patient will present with seemingly just a problem in one eye and uh, to balance the problem, you do need to operate in the other eye. And it can be hard to get the patient on board with that and make them understand where you're coming from, but you have to try. Um, so again, in managing them, wait until they're stable. Uh, manage in the meantime with prisms and occlusion and um, consider you know I don't always image these patients to look at the muscles but sometimes it is useful to do that and um, generally because it's a restrictive and fibrotic process you, there won't be a role for Botox for these patients and um, in a previous um, presentation I said to um, to always um, uh, do adjustable suture surgery but I've changed it to always consider adjustable suture surgery because um, that may not be the, the right answer for every patient and um, in this lady I didn't do adjustable surgery because I knew that if um, what I was doing with their left eye was not enough I was going to have to do the right eye anyway 
um, and uh, I prefer to stage these surgeries to um, allow for complete healing and see really what we get uh, after the first the first go, you know. So try and improve ipsilateral motility first. You know, you're trying to fix the problem where the problem is. That's always a good maxim. And then the priorities in terms of where you're getting their eye position to be good is primary gaze position first, then down gaze or reading position, and then you're trying to improve or, or fix the horizontal and finally the up gaze movement. So um, just finally, um, Again, managing the patient expectations is key um, with the, what's probably the most frequent surgery of inferior rectus recession. You have to tell the patient beforehand that they may end up with lower lid retraction. And of course, this can make the appearance of their proptosis worse. So you really have to tell them that beforehand because that will be the source of quite an unhappy patient when they come back. Um, because they come back and they say, oh, you, you know, yeah, I don't have double vision anymore, but you, you, you made my appearance worse and you made, you know, the bulging of my eye worse. And they always say, you know, my right eye looks bigger than my left or whichever way around it is. And of course, these are challenging patients. So you, you do have to be ready to have your successes and have your so-called failures as well. And these may relapse because they can, um, re, you know, their, their condition can reactivate as well. So again, the idea of them needing multiple surgeries is an important thing to convey to the patient before you um, lay your hands on them first. And that is it. Fantastic. Uh, sounds like a challenging core to patients to manage. Um, delicate balance. It's just from a pathophysiology point of view. I mean, it seems to be, as you mentioned, independent of the control of the thyroid function or the, you know, the thyroid, uh, what we would consider the normal, keeping the TFTs in, in line. So presumably there's some sort of autoimmune inflammatory process which is independent of thyroid function. I'm just wondering, is there any sort of medical therapy to prevent it or does it work? Yeah, I don't know about a medical therapy to prevent, but certainly, um, you know, medical therapies are, are key in thyroid and uh, typically that takes the form of, of steroids really, you know? Yeah. Um, but usually nowadays, most people would deliver this steroid uh, intravenously. Um, oh. So this lady had three different courses of oral steroids and um, I think, you know, mo most people who are uh, experience in dealing with uh, patients with thyroid eye disease would probably disagree with that approach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So no real role, role for disease modifying agents, antibody um, treatments, like or anything. Yeah, I think that's something that's that is coming on stream. That's um, that's that's a newer type of approach. Um, I can't think what agent they're using at the moment, but. Um, It'll be it'll be it'll be kind of my orbital and oculoplastic colleagues that will be uh, more involved in that and the endocrinology side. The idea of having you know MDTs, thyroid MDTs, is um, reasonably well, certainly reasonably recent in this country anyway. But it's it's really the way to go with these patients. You get the best outcomes when you've got everyone on board uh, early. You know. Fantastic. Any other comments from the panel? It's just suppose again, thyroid disease, uh, thanks, that was a lovely presentation. Uh, we tend to think of the older patient as the nodule, so they don't often have, quote unquote, the autoimmune other side effects, and it's just usually cardiac in nature, um, whereas the more younger patient is the, we tend to think of the autoimmune form and will have all these other systemic symptoms. Often with the thyroid eye patients, if you look clear, they will often have a tremor, they'll have a thyroid tremor, which is very like a physiological, exaggerated physiological tremor, but you'll often see the same. And you know, I have a number of videos of patients with nice tired tremor, and you often note the eyes are a bit, um, are affected. And I, again, I, I think you point out it is an autoimmune mechanism. I think it's to do with fibroblasts, but in the uh, orbit, there's a mechanism of um, autoantibody. I think that's not pretty fully um, assessed, but there are monoclonals being tried for that. Uh, there's one beginning with T, Terra or something, Mab, I've forgotten the full title, that's in trials for thyroid disease. Um, B cell, T cell mediated this debate. I think T cell is the plump on it, but that's where they're at at present. Um, but difficult problem. Thank you.
Thank you, Tim. Um, so, um, uh, any other comments on that uh, case or the disease in general? I might just make one last comment on the previous case again, if that's okay. I think um, Eva Kani mentioned the false localizing sign of six, which is an important one. Um, and the reason of that course is, as she mentioned, the six punches into the back of the coronal sinus going under the kind of petrol ligament. So if you've got high pressure above that and the meninges are being pushed out, it can often be pushed down and you can pinch the sixth either unilaterally or bilaterally as it comes in, as it comes into the back of the cavernous sinus at the time. So it's one of those common ones you can miss out and you, you're looking for six and you're not realizing there may be raised intracranial pressure. So looking for papadema, et cetera, is key in that case too. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Edward and Anita, for fantastic presentations. And uh, thank you for um, rounding off the uh, Ireland East Hospital Group Grand Rounds for this uh, academic year. And um, we will be starting again in September. And uh, we're going to do probably alternate with more generic trainee focused uh, topics, uh, alternating months with uh, between um local sites so that's something something to change something new to look forward to so um thank you actually that now Tom, tomas i think i'd welcome anybody any thoughts or suggestions on it i think there's a good we're thinking as tomas said that maybe we might tackle some other big issues for example that the just culture concept looking at systemic failures if there's errors done rather than pointing individual fingers that happens in the Irish system medically legally, and we thought that would be one we should tackle and other issues, because uh, these are uh, affecting us for their, our career and we don't really debate them enough. And there are um, areas of the world that do just culture and they have a much better system with regard to that. And hence there's an improvement of care of the patient rather than individuals getting blamed. So that's one topic we think we should tackle, but there's many others. So open to suggestions on that. Yeah, I think we're, go we're going to do a session on sort of well-being and, uh, you know, we, we had fantastic input from Jim Gavin with his um, sort of uh, pilot investigating um, investigating air, air accidents in Ireland and their approach to that, which I thought was very interesting in, in dealing with uh, sort of medical error and learning from it. So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to be to be discussed. And so that's something to look forward to. There's a very interesting book actually called Black Box Thinking that I recommend to uh, all my trainees to read. It's, uh, it's really super and it does talk about the whole airline safety approach and you know how it, how it kind of differs from the medical scene and how we can learn an awful lot from them. It's a great book. One hundred by Edward. Black Box Thinking by Matthew. He's the guy who did um, Bounce, Matthew Syed. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it should be compulsory reading yeah. for all uh, doctors. Yeah, 100%. And, and, and medical students. I agree 100%. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was so book. good that I lent it to a former trainee and she kept it. <laughs> that was all my books. <laughs> yeah, well, if that's one message to take uh, when you're on your summer holidays, um, the audiobook, the audiobooks are great, but I, I actually very rarely actually buy a book, but uh, I had listened to it in audiobook, but I had to buy the book as well, which is, yeah. Uh, which is, so yes, 100% agree with you on that one. I don't think of a lot to learn from that. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, thank everybody. Thank you all. Brilliant. Thanks, great for, thanks, for thanks for that. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Have a good Bye. day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.